Hi everybody, this is Dominic here. Uh, today we are going to be moving forward with uh, the use of our 3D forms and we're going to make it um, a little bit more mathematical and scientific. We're going to be exploring the idea of perspective. Specifically one point perspective, but I'd like you to know where one point perspective comes from. So we're going to look at its history a little bit. I like to start by telling, showing you images that have no perspective in them really at all. Uh, this is an image of Egyptian art and Egyptians, aside from always drawing things from the side, uh, they, they really didn't worry about showing space. Everything is incredibly flat. The woman on the left with the wings is enormous. If she were to be standing up instead of kneeling, next to the woman on the right, she would probably be twice her size. They're using size to show importance in these images. They really don't care about showing space because everything is so flat. The same thing is kind of happening in Greek and in Roman art. They didn't really worry about the background. They showed you a place by giving you, you know, a column, some steps here in this image, but really, we don't know where they are. There's no sky, there's no ground, there's no trees. The scenery just isn't there. They ignored it and told the story anyway. It wasn't really until you got to medieval art, which is primarily religious, that people even attempted to fill out these scenes. But they're still sort of relying on those same ideas that you saw back in Egyptian art. If you look at the religious men in that large tower in the middle of the scene, they are so much larger than any of the peasants around them. Same thing goes with this medieval image. They wanted to try and fit in a whole big crowd of people, but they didn't know how to do it in a flat space. So they took all of the heads of the people to the right and to the left of this enormous rendition of um, Mary and Jesus here, and they stacked them. They just put people's heads on top of one another. It almost looks like they're sitting in bleachers or standing on bleachers, but they're not. They're probably just flat on the ground, one behind the other, and the artist just didn't understand how to show that space. It really wasn't until Italian Renaissance that perspective came into effect. A gentleman named Brunelleschi, who was actually an architect and not an artist, he kind of discovered almost by accident one point perspective. He used a lot of mathematics, he used some interesting sort of tools, and he was able to see through his architecture that all of the lines of his building would converge to one point. You have looked at one point perspective previously, uh, you probably drew a picture of a road that went to a point and it may have had telephone poles on the sides or trees. But this image from the Renaissance, it shows this really well. This is The Last Supper by Da Vinci. Everything is converging on Jesus' head. You can see the lines here. There's the horizontal line through the middle. That would be his horizon line. And then he's got all of these diagonal lines through the page that are all meeting right there at Jesus's head. He is the vanishing point. During the Renaissance, people published readings, books, papers about perspective, and art perspective became very well known. This image by Holbein is the next kind of step they started to get used to making things that were convincingly real. You can see in that still life there on the table, everything looks like it is going back in space on the shelf and is believably 3D. But then there's this weird blob on the floor in the front. Can you tell what it is? You might need to turn your head some. It might not work for you, so I'll provide it for you here. But he's playing with perspective. He's now trying to see what all he can do with it. Perspective became very important to artists and everyone was using it because they wanted to be able to show a realistic looking environment. This is a painting by one of Mrs. Dominic's favorite artists, Gustave Caillebeau. He's a French artist. 
And he's got really pretty obvious one point perspective going on here. Let's see if we can find everything we need to. Most of one point perspective is based off of the vanishing point. The vanishing point is where everything leads to and where items would disappear in your vision. For Kaebo's image, everything seems to converge right about where this gentleman's face is. That tells me that his vanishing point is right there. There is also a horizon line right there. If you look from the left all the way across to the right, his horizon line is right about at the top of the fence over there on the right hand side. And then right about at the top of the fence again on the opposite side of the road. He's using these converging lines to show a lot of space. He's also using some of those other things to show space. He's got the bridge being very tall and big filling his page on the right hand side and everything that goes that is further back in the space appears smaller. That is a result of one point perspective but he knows that and he's using that to his advantage. He's making this bridge appear incredibly long. Now some of you are thinking wait a minute last week we drew these 3D forms. Wasn't I drawing in perspective? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. The two boxes here on the page, the one on the left and the one on the right, the front face of them are the same. The one on the left is not in perspective. It is merely 3D. You or I could freehand that now. We have a regular square with the diagonal lines that just merely go back. They are parallel lines, but not perspective lines. Those lines would never meet, so they are not in perspective. There is no vanishing point that those lines will all meet up to. The box on the right is the same size box. However, it is in one point perspective. The three lines that appear to go back in space, where those three corners where the faces all meet, they go back and they would converge. They would meet at a point. So this box is in perspective. We are going to be working with one point perspective today. So in just a minute, we're going to skip over to studio, Mrs. Dan. All right, here we go. Uh, we have already looked at the basics through some famous works of art. But now we're going to use that basic information to do an exercise with one point perspective. For this, I have a white sheet of paper, pencil. I have cut out for myself a little square uh, just to show you what I'm looking for mostly. But if you want to just hand draw your squares onto your paper or if you want to find something square with pointy corners like this, to trace, that is fine. You just do not want something that's absolutely enormous and square because uh, it will take over your paper and then the perspective won't be very nice. Uh, you also are going to want a ruler of some kind. If you don't have a ruler available to you, a straight edge will work great. So a straight edge to me is something that is thick enough that I can take my pencil and put it right alongside of it and not like smash it. Um, and something that is um, machine made so you know that it is straight. All right, first thing we need to do is choose our horizon line. So I'm going to put my horizon line a little bit above the middle of the paper, ever so slightly. Again, using my ruler or your straight edge to make sure that this line is straight. Do your best on that. I know it's a little bit tricky. Then we're going to identify where our vanishing point is. Remember, that is the point where all of our lines are going to converge to and meet at. I'm going to put the vanishing point right on the horizon line. And you can make it fairly big um, for this, but you don't need to um, make it obnoxiously big, okay? 
With my little square that I traced, I'm going to trace three boxes. I'm going to trace one below the horizon line, one above the horizon line, and one on the horizon line. Please don't trace your boxes or draw them so that they are diamondy. Uh, you could. It wouldn't make a whole ton of difference, but please do them so that they're square, regular, and upright. Okay, so I have my three boxes. With my ruler, I'm going to take the three corners that are closest to the vanishing point and draw diagonal lines, like we saw in that picture earlier, from that corner to the dot. Okay, so line it up. Now I'm gonna flip it over so you can see. Line it up as best you can. So. These three corners are the three that were closest to my dot. So I drew that diagonal line from the corner to the top, corner to the dot, corner to the dot. Okay. I'm going to do that with all three dots, or all three squares. Okay, here we go. Right now, this image should sort of look like these three boxes are zooming out at us, like um, something from a 3D movie. You notice I drew three squares, or three diagonal lines for the square below the horizon line and three diagonal lines for the square above the horizon line. But they show different parts of the box. This one is above my field of vision, so I can see the bottom area of the box. This one is below my field of vision, so I can see the top of the box. But this box over here, we only drew two lines because it is right there at my field of vision. My eye level is right here on the horizon line. I cannot see the top of this box or the bottom of the box. I can only see the front of it. If I had drawn more diagonal lines from these corners, they would have gone through the face of the box. And I don't want that. I don't want see-through boxes. I want opaque boxes. I want solid boxes, not clear boxes. So this line wouldn't have worked. And the same thing down here. This would have been that see-through sort of thing again. It would have gone through the center of the box. And I don't really want that either. Does it look cool? Yes. Is it what I'm looking for? No. Okay. So above the dot will show me two sides. Below the dot will show me two sides. And in line with the dot will only show me one. From here, you can make horizontal and vertical lines to make these things rectangles if you would like. But this is about all I need with the boxes. The last thing I want you to do is to find an empty spot in your page, whether it's a corner above or a corner below, and I want you to draw in box letters your initials. So Mrs. Dominic's initials are I'm going to use this same fundamental principle that I used here, taking the corners, bringing them to the dot on my letters so that my letters look like they are also zooming out from the dot. Okay, Every last corner. Got a corner on my H, draw the diagonal line. Got another corner on my H, draw the diagonal line. And you only don't draw the diagonal line if it looks like it would go through the letter. So this one I can draw. This one, however, if I were to go from this corner to that corner, it would go through the top half of my H, and I don't want that, so that's not a good one, good corner to do. This corner, however, I can also do. Good. This one I can do. I'm just not going to draw it through the letter. I would stop right there. Okay. I think that's all my corners for my H. If I were to do this corner, it would totally go through my H. And if I were to draw this corner, it would totally go through my H. So that's it for my H.
And then I'm also going to do the same thing for my D. Now the D is a little trickier because my H is in the way. So I'm only going to draw where I would see the lines. I'm still lining up this lower corner with the dot up top, but I'm not going to draw through the upper vertical of my H. Okay, so that one stops there. This one over here. Go as far as I can. Now this D is a little bit tricky. So what I'm going to do is line up, because it's a curve, right? It's not a corner corner. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to come over here to the widest spot where my where the line would meet the edge of my D and not curve around, which I think is going to be somewhere over here. So this end gets met up with the dot. One end of my ruler's on the dot. Then I'm just going to swing my ruler to the side until it just touches the curved edge of my D, like that. Now I do have this in here, and this would be a tube. And if it was, um, if the angle in my D was like the angle in my H, I would go ahead and put another line in there, but it's not. It's curved all the way around, so I'm just going to leave that one empty. Okay? This is all I need you to do for this week, is show me that you know how to put an object above the horizon line connected to the dot, below the horizon line connected to the dot, and on the horizon line and connected to the dot. I also want to know that you can find all of the, the corners that you would connect in your initials and connect those to the dot. You do not need to color this. You do not need to shade it. You do not need to do anything crazy to it. This is all I need for this week. Once you have done this, um, take a picture of it, attach it to the assignment on Teams, and you are all done for art for this week. I wish you luck. If you are having questions or problems or issues, please reach out to me. I'm here for you. See you next week. Bye.